Alrighty, hello everybody, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Dishonesty is the Second Best Policy and Other Rules to Live By by David Mitchell. David Mitchell, the comedian from Peep Show and that Mitchell and Webb look, as opposed to David Mitchell of Cloud Atlas fame. Uh, this is basically a collection of articles that he wrote for a newspaper, and so because of that, it does have that thing that any collection like this has where it feels a little disjointed, but that's okay. I do enjoy his humour. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end so Dane reads David Mitchell's 2014 bestseller thinking about it only makes it worse must really have made people think because everything's got worse we've gone from UKIP surge to Brexit shambles from horse meat in lasagna to Donald Trump in the White House from Woolworths going under to all the other shops going under it's probably socially irresponsible even to try to cheer up but if you're determined to give it a go you might enjoy this eclectic collection or a collection of David Mitchell's attempts to make light of all that darkness scampy politics the Olympics terrorism exercise rude street names inheritance tax salad cream proportional representation and fart are all touched upon by Mitchell's unremitting laser of chit chat as he negotiates a path between the commercialization of Christmas and the true spirit of Halloween read this book and slightly change your life well how could I refuse a call to action like that so Let's go to the introduction. So th this made me chuckle because this is extremely relatable to me. He says, personally I lie quite often, mainly about whether I'm free to attend social events. It's all because the phrase I can come but I don't want to seems not to be permitted. There's no way of dressing that sentiment up so that it's socially acceptable. I'll have a go though. It's so kind of you to invite me and I'm sincerely grateful for the thought but on that day I know I will be tired and would prefer to stay at home. And I very much doubt that you'd really want me to come if I really don't want to myself. So if it's okay, I won't. And I've gone blurry, I have no idea why. There we go. He quotes Albert Camus who said, Fiction is the lie through which we tell the truth. And he talks about alternative therapies and he said, It's often said that a strength of alternative therapies such as homeopathy is that its practitioners, because they're in a private healthcare environment, have time to listen to and express concern about a patient's problems. In a way an overstretched NHS doctor doesn't. The listening and concern alone make patients feel better, which is why homeopathy is an ideal treatment for anyone who doesn't quite feel like 100%, but isn't actually at all ill. And he makes a good point here, he says, When women try to reverse the effects of aging, it's a way of coping with the patriarchy. When men do it, they're just kidding themselves about death. We got some chat about Matt, Matt Hancock as health secretary where he talked about, in the UK we are spending 97 billion of public money on treating disease and only 8 billion preventing it. And they do say prevention is better than the cure and I've worked on a book called The, the Future of Healthcare which takes a kind of deeper look at that. And he says here, a recent survey found that 77% of us think that between a male and a female, the male should foot the bill. Of the 1,000 respondents, 73% of the women and 82% of the men said it was for the bloke to get his card out that's talking about paying on dates. Um, and I disagree with that. And uh, Mitchell does as well. He says, the most worrying aspect of this is the extent to which research suggests that paying increases men's sexual expectations. That extent is some extent, not no extent, which seems slightly grim. Are there really significant numbers of men who believe that any woman who agreed to dine with them secretly belong to a strange breed of casual hookers who get paid in meals? At the very least, they must be wildly overestimating the scarcity of food in Western economies. And he talks about people who uh, take photos um, especially when they're on holiday or at concerts and things and how people say that's a bad thing and you should live in the moment. And he says, I agree that the best way to enjoy a holiday is to unselfconsciously be in the moment. But the trouble is, once it's occurred to you to take a picture, whatever you then do is already self-conscious, taking it or not taking it. In fact, you could argue that by that point, it's more unselfconscious to take the photo rather than to deliberately suppress the urge and stand there, phone hand twitching, telling yourself it's mindfulness. I generally find that tourists who relentlessly photograph their experiences instead of just living them nevertheless seem quite content with their choice. Meanwhile, the Just Remember It Brigade spend a lot of time crossly muttering about other people's camera phones, partly because their view of the waterfall, fireworks, temple, car crash is being obstructed, but largely because the rest of the human race is just incredibly annoying. Neither group is in the moment, but at least the former gets some nice photos. All right, so a few tabs here, because he was talking about veganism. Um, this is actually quite a famous article of his in vegan circles, because he makes some very good points. So he begins with, speaking as a meat eater, I find it annoying how many vegans there suddenly are. I suppose a few other meat eaters feel the same. Do you some meat eaters, if you're really honest with yourselves? I don't know, mate, I'm vegan. Vegan power. He says, I think what I find annoying deep down, and again, some meat eaters, you don't have to own up to this, but it might interest you to discover whether you secretly agree, is the very fact that I can't discount vegans anymore. The thing that's annoying about there suddenly being lots of them is the nagging suspicion that they may be right. When there were hardly any vegans, I hardly ever had to think about that. So he's talking about here, uh, 
I ought to explain why I'm talking about this now. There's a vegan in the news, his name is Jordi Casamichana, who is campaigning to get ethical veganism protected as a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. He's calling it ethical veganism to distinguish it from veganism for purely dietary reasons. Some people only eat a vegan diet but they don't care about the environment or the animals, they only care about their health, he told the BBC. I suppose to him they're like Blairites to a Corbynista, worse than cannibals. Not really, we kind of see it as all, as long as you're coming at it from one of the three angles, the environment, your health, or animal rights, it's all good, you know. Going for one of them benefits the other two anyway. Uh, he used to work for the League Against Cruel Sports, but it wasn't vegan enough for him. He says he discovered that the League's pension fund invested in companies that carried out animal testing and was sacked for telling people, which he characterises as being discriminated against for his veganism. The League disagrees, saying he was sacked because of gross misconduct. To link his dismissal with issues pertaining to veganism is factually wrong. The employment tribunal that's going to decide this will also rule on whether veganism meets the Equality Act's definition of a belief. According to the Act, it has to be a belief as to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. It must attain a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion and importance, and be worthy of respect in a democratic society, compatible with human dignity and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. I'm loath to admit it, but it totally qualifies, doesn't it? And he finishes here by saying, Ethics, practically speaking, are relative. Our ethical compasses are cal calibrated according to the norms of the time in which we live. So I eat dead animals because I was brought up to eat dead animals. It seemed like almost everyone did when I was younger. And the tiny minority who didn't certainly had lots of cheese and eggs. It was normal, and it still is not normal, just a little bit less so. It's not uncommon in the history of human societies for things once deemed normal to start being deemed wrong. Sometimes it's something like homophobia, sometimes it's something like openly criticising those in power. It depends on the time and the society. Maybe all these vegans are harbingers of such a change. It annoys me because it makes me worry that I'm becoming a victim of history, just like all the animals I've eaten. So he writes about uh, a letter that some churches send out, basically providing people with religious ways they can celebrate Halloween. Um, so instead of trick-or-treating, he suggests groups of children dressed in hero costumes along with responsible adults taking treats to the houses in the community, including a card with a simple illustration and Bible verse. And Mitchell writes, on the face of it, these sound like the lamest ideas since the Amstrad emailer, but think about it. A child dressed as a saint meekly coming to the door and handing out biblical quotations. That's terrifying. That's like an actual ghost. Yeah, good point. And he talks about Brexit and he quotes uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, who said, It's an outrage that people as ignorant as me are being asked to vote. This is a complicated matter of economics, politics, history, and we live in a representative democracy, not a plebiscite democracy. You could make a case for having plebiscites on certain issues. I can imagine somebody arguing for one on fox hunting, for example, but not on something as involved as the European Union. This should be a matter for Parliament. And indeed, if it was, we might not be in the mess we're in today. And then he writes about Theresa May. He says, saying she's going to resign is Theresa May's current technique for keeping her job. She says she's going to resign tomorrow in order to remain Prime Minister today. What a committed Remainer. But she's taking it one day at a time. She's in recovery from not being Prime Minister and the first step is admitting her powerless. And then he's reflecting on Trump's election. He says, maybe he didn't mean what he said. Maybe the Republican Party will restrain him. Politicians never get much done anyway. Maybe it'll all be fine. This either makes me an over-dramatizing hypocrite a few days ago or a, re or a reality denying fool now. So I feel lazy, stupid and humiliated by the disturbance to my complacency as if someone had burst in while I was eating a cream cake in the bath. And then he writes about MI6 and he says, uh, we know who the heads of these organisations are. We know, for example, that MI6's current C is really called Alex Younger, thus reducing the code name to the same trivial ceremonial level as Blackrod and the Stig. And then finally on uh, the idea of a cashless society. He goes, one might almost suspect it was no accident that the new fiver had animal fat in it. Expect the next £20 to be gummed together with GM crops and foie gras with a picture of Jimmy Savile on the back. And yeah, that's why I do not like having money. That's kind of pushed me towards a... Uh, a cashless society because it's not vegan to use money anymore. And he writes, this may sound paranoid, credit cards are convenient and most people have nothing to hide. Why does it matter if all our payments are traceable? Just because someone is constantly following you around at a slight distance, it doesn't mean they're going to do you harm. But I imagine those who are constantly tailed really value a few hours break from it now and again. And if asking for such a break, they'd probably be irritated if the response was, why? Looking for a chance to stare at some kiddie porn and plan an act of terrorism, are you? So I can kind of see the arguments for and against the cashless society. I mean, I'm all for it, personally. 
but you know I mean we just need to switch to a decentralized currency like a cryptocurrency and then we won't have these problems but yes dishonesty is the second best policy and other rules to live by by David Mitchell I did enjoy this I mean David Mitchell is one of my favorite comedians anyway and he does have like an insightful take on uh, world events don't always agree with him but I, I, I like the way he writes about things even when I don't agree with him my only real complaint is because of the very format of this because it's a collection of articles it doesn't necessarily flow very well it doesn't have like a narrative from beginning to end kind of thing but what are you gonna do that's the nature of the beast you know overall I still enjoyed it I gave it a four out of five so there we have it that's what I made of dishonesty is the second best policy and other rules to live by by David Mitchell as always don't forget to let me know your thoughts in the comments uh, if you've enjoyed this video hit that like button <laughs> hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye